For years, anytime I was asked about the best way to use 464 soy wax for candle making, I replied with a trash can, being set on fire. How do I feel today? Has my opinion changed? And why or why not? Hi everyone, my name is Wade Thomas. I'm the owner of Black Tie Barn Candle Company, and I appreciate all of you for stopping by and for being here. If you are new to this channel and you are interested in any other videos about candle making or running a candle business or anything related at all, uh, there's just three things you can do real quick that only take a few seconds to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Plus, it really helps us support the channel so I can continue to make you more videos in the future. And that is to one, subscribe by hitting the subscribe button below. Also, turn on the notifications by just clicking that little bell icon. YouTube will, will notify you whenever I do post a new video. And then the last thing is just to give this video a thumbs up by liking the video that lets YouTube know that you are engaged and you like the content and it will deliver more to you. And once again, I appreciate you all for being here. So I started this video out uh, letting you know that anytime anyone asked me the best way to use 464 soy wax was just by replying with a picture of a trash can. Do I still feel the same way today? Not quite. When I first started using 464 soy wax back in the early days of me making candles. Um, I, I didn't really like it then. Uh, I did retest it several times, a handful of times over the years and still really wasn't quite fond any of those times either. But I gotta admit, it's better than I remember. Uh, and it performed a lot better than the first candles I was making when I first started, which is no surprise when I first started making candles. I was clueless and I had no idea what I was really doing. As a side note, when I first started making candles, uh, there really wasn't a lot of resources out there. No YouTube channels, no Facebook groups, nothing like that. You really just had to learn from uh, finding books on the subject and testing and experimenting for yourself. Nothing to tell you if something was right or wrong or how to make it better. It was just more difficult then than it is now. So I was willing to grant 464 a pass uh, just because of my lack of candle making skills when I first started. But even still, over the years of testing it several other times, I just I just didn't really like it. Too many problems, too many issues, and I just didn't think the end results uh, justified the amount of work you had to do to make good 464 candles. At least that was my opinion. But again, now I do like it much better than I used to. Do I love it? Not really. Is it perfect? No, but no waxes are. They all have benefits and disadvantages, pros and cons. My goal is to simply make the most out of using the wax. My pursuit here is to try to make the best candle that I can with it. Okay, so let's recap uh, and, and really establish where we are today because this is technically part two of a part one video. You don't necessarily need to watch them in any particular order, but let's go ahead and recap where we are to this point because some of the information from part one is going to be used or referenced in the rest of this video. So over the past couple of months, I had decided to start a new series on basically testing thoroughly several different candle waxes on the market, at least the ones that most candle makers like you and I um, have access to and would use uh, in our candle making recipes. And the goal in doing all this thorough testing of each of these different wax types is really in pursuit of finding the best or the most optimal way to use that wax. All waxes are different and unique and they all need to be treated and used uniquely and differently from one another. And that is the whole purpose of testing them individually is to come up with the op optimal way, the best way to use each of them. I decided to start with 464 soy wax, mostly because of its availability and its popularity. It is by far one of, if not the most common waxes for new candle makers to start with because it's so easy to find. Most suppliers have it. Uh, it's a very attractive wax because of the way it's marketed, being a soy wax. And because so many people are using it, it's easy to get so much information about it. And to top it off, it is a very polarizing wax. There are certain things that people love about it, but there are a lot of issues with using 464 wax as well. And so I thought it was a perfect wax to start this series with. Again, this is part two of 464 testing, and I will link part one in the description below. And back on part one, I'll have this part linked as well. You know what I mean? Part one, which will be, again be linked below, really focused on using the wax and its appearance, um, its texture, uh, sinkholes, uh, frosting, jar adhesion, uh, things like that. But we also did establish some testing parameters in that video as well, uh, because I used different variables or I changed different variables in those test jars so that when we tested them for part two, this video, we would have some information to base some of our decisions on. For example, we altered the pour temperature on a few of them. We added Vibar in a couple of them. Uh, we used some different wicks, uh, things like that. And so this video is gonna be focused on those variables and what impact they had, if any, 
on the results uh, like wicking and sinkholes and hot throw. Basically in this video, we're discussing these test results, what seemed to work best, what seemed not to have much of an effect at all. And of course, we will also discuss a little bit about wicking. Now, before we go any further, a little bit of a disclaimer here. We are focused on the specifics of all of this information in the specific jars that I used in these two videos, which was the nine ounce straight sided jar, eight ounce small mason jar. They're very similar in size, minor differences a little bit just because of the shape. But the main reason I chose those jars is because they are so popular, they're economical, they're widely supplied by most uh, candle making supply companies. Uh, there's just a very, very common jar. I can't test every single jar in a video, obviously. So uh, I just chose two that I thought were a couple of the most common and basic jars for this purpose. So of course, results and your process and some of these details will vary from jar to jar. And all of the information in this video, and really all my videos for that matter, is based off my own experiences, my own testing, uh, my own environment. You might have totally different opinions based off of your own research, your own testing, but either way, I do hope that uh, the content in this video and the rest of my videos do give you some help. And of course, feel free to ask questions in the comments. So the roadmap for the rest of this video will look like this. It's gonna be broken into four main sections. The first is, the overall pros and benefits of using 464 that I found in my opinion. Next section will be the cons or disadvantages of using this wax. Then we're gonna look at the specific stuff that we were looking for in testing based on the testing parameters we created in part one. So we're gonna be talking about all the changes and things that we did in part one and what effect they did or didn't have on uh, the overall performance of the candle. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with my overall thoughts and tips for using 464. First pro that comes to mind for using 464 is that it just has a great melt pool. 464 is a low melt point wax and with proper wicking, it will create a great, full, perfect looking melt pool that will get you deep enough but not overly deep that you'll end up with a great hot throw and a good burning candle. Some waxes struggle to develop a good melt pool and it can be tough to achieve one wall to wall or at least safely from edge to edge of the candle, 464 does a great job with a good overall melt pool if wicked properly. The next pro is the clean burn. Now there's a huge debate on what really is a clean burn. For example, some people argue paraffin is not a clean burn and soy is a clean burn just because of their properties. And I have other videos on that topic, so I'm not gonna get into that today. But while I'm, what I mean about a clean burn is you just don't get any soot buildup and any soot that you are seeing, it's lighter in color. It's almost like a grayish color, which is common with soy wax, that you just don't see as much of it. So you do get a more aesthetically looking, appealing, burning candle because you're not seeing smoke or soot flicker off of the flame near as much. Uh, it just seems to be a very effective combustion process uh, when wicked properly. And 464, being a complete soy candle, is also going to give you a better overall burn time most of the time. Again, there are factors that affect that. And if it's wicked properly, I feel like I'm going to say that a ton, but you do get a good burn time out of this waxes. It will vary by your jars. So I can't give you specific numbers, but it does burn a long time. You get a lot of burn for your buck. Another benefit is, as we talked about in part one, is some of the visuals. Not all of the visuals, which we'll talk about in the cons section, but one of the visuals that was a that is a benefit of using 464 is by far the jar adhesion. The, the way the wax settles up against the side of the jar. You don't get any of what's called wet spots where it looks like, uh, it kind of looks like it's wet, but really the wax is pulled away from the jar. None of that has any impact on the performance of a candle, but it does look really, really nice when the wax is perfectly smooth around the entire outside of the jar up against the glass, especially if you're using clear jars where you can see the wax. In part one, we talked about that quite a bit. It's actually harder to not get good jar adhesion with 464 than it is to get it. <laughs> Whereas with other waxes, sometimes you're pulling your hair out trying to get decent jar adhesion. Another benefit is that the cold throw is excellent. Again, we talked about this in part one, but I just wanted to mention it again because this video is not only focused on the testing results, but also the overall thoughts. And cold throw, again, was great with 464. Most of your natural waxes, and like soy and coconut waxes, are gonna have great cold throw, and this definitely hit that mark. Now, so what about hot throw? Hot throw is, is one of the major arguments against using 464. Um, it's not that it can't be good, it's just that it's very, well, we'll get into it later. The reason I have this in the pro section is, in my testing, my results, I was able to get better hot throw than I remember previously. Um, I thought it did a good job of filling the rooms, especially in the size of jars I was using. I didn't have any complaints with the hot throw. 
but we will talk about that a little bit more later in this video, but that is why I do have it as an advantage here. Now let's move on to the cons. What are some of the drawbacks of using 464? And don't let this worry you or freak you out if you are looking to use 464 because all waxes have advantages and drawbacks. So one of the drawbacks with 464, in my opinion, is by far the biggest drawback. Um, this is the one that I spent the most time battling and that is the presence of sinkholes and air pockets. This problem is not exclusive or unique to 464 wax. It is very common with a lot of soy waxes. But there are other waxes that do it as well. But sinkholes are basically pockets that develop usually underneath the surface. Sometimes you can see them on the surface, but they are usually hidden underneath. And it's little areas where the wax did not solidify or come together and it's either pulled away or left air pockets or little holes. And you wouldn't think that's too big of a deal if you don't see it, except for when your wick and the flame hits those air pockets, your flame will drown out. Uh, it will just fizzle out um, and it can cause some problems. In fact, it can really completely ruin your candle if it's too significant. When we get to a uh, later part of this video though, we will talk about some tips and strategies on how to deal with that problem. The second con uh, is really just the result of the first thing we just talked about being sinkholes, and that is your drowning wicks. Uh, 464 and other soy waxes are uh, temperamental to say the least, and they will have issues like sinkholes and things where they're not consistent batch to batch and sometimes not consistent candle to candle. You might make a batch of eight candles, six of them burn great and two of them drown out. Um, and that again is usually caused by something like a sinkhole or an air pocket. So if you can eliminate those, then you're not gonna really have this problem, but it is difficult sometimes to keep your wicks performing consistently candle to candle. The next is another visual. So we talked about a, a pro on the visual side. Now we're talking about the con on the negative side. And one of those problems is related to how the candles will reharden after they're being burned. So you might have a perfect looking candle the first time when the customer goes to light it. And then after it's uh, after they burn it once and it re and it cools and rehardens back up, uh, it's got a terrible looking top. Some sinkholes have formed, you get a cratered little look. Some people describe it as looking like cottage cheese, but to me, it's more like a rough, cratered, bumpy top. It's just not real pleasant to look at. Usually, in this case, these effects that show up after the candle's been burned once aren't gonna cause problems, but if it's so significant, um, combined with like pre-existing sinkholes that we talked about earlier, then they really can cause some issues burning the candle. But again, it, this is mostly an appearance thing and most customers, most candle makers can just relate to their customers that, uh, that this is just uh, common with soy and natural waxes and that uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't affect the candle but yes it can look a little strange after you burn it another visual issue is frosting uh, this one's really really tough there's not a ton you can do about this we talked about in part one we'll talk about it a little bit later on some ways to combat that but frosting is that crystallized white patterns that start showing up on the surface and the sides of your candle you can see it mostly when using of course clear glass but also on your colored dyed candles you don't see it um, on your uh, natural colored candles very much, but you will see it on your colored ones as you can see in some of these pictures and videos if I remember to put them up. It's just something that eventually usually happens with temperature changes, um, not a lot you can do about it. A lot of people do stress over trying to prevent it. Um, we, we tried a few things in this, in this video series as well with moderate success, but I wouldn't ever claim anything that's gonna be 100% effective against frosting. So I think it's just something you're gonna have to occasionally live with if you plan to use this wax. Again, it's not gonna cause any problems with the performance, it's just an appearance, a visual thing. And the last con is really just playing devil's advocate to the last pro I mentioned, which was about hot throw. I said the hot throw was pretty good in the pro section, better than I remember, but as far as the con section goes, I would just say that the hot throw, while good, still isn't as good as some other waxes on the market. I don't know that that's necessarily a con because not all waxes can be the best at hot throw. Um, just like all can't be the best at cold throw and the best at wicking and so on. But um, while the hot throw is good, there are some better ones out there. We've talked about them on this channel and I will review other waxes as we continue to go. But the main reason that, that 464 isn't, I would say, gets kind of a negative mark when it comes to hot throw isn't because it doesn't have good hot throw with the right fragrance oils. The problem is finding the right fragrance oils. We'll talk about this in the last part of this video. Choosing your fragrance oils carefully um, is very important with 464 because when it works well, it works fantastic. And when it doesn't work, it doesn't work at all. 
Okay, so let's get into the specifics uh, for the things that we were testing for in part one of this video as well. So we added Vibar, um, and if you haven't checked out part one video, you don't necessarily have to, like, like I mentioned before, you can finish this video and then go check it out. Um, but if you do remember part one, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about here. We did pick a couple candles, lavender, uh, driftwood, for example, which is the one I, I added a drop of purple to keep track of, uh, is one of the ones we added Vibar. And so the first question was, would Vibar help with the hot throw? Well, the short answer in this situation was no. And that's not shocking to me. There is some misinformation about Vibar. Um, and I don't want to say that it's it's never helps hot throw. It's just that's not its purpose. And I don't want to go into crazy detail about Vibar in this video. I've got a video on Vibar. If I remember, I'll link it. You can check it out. But the real reason for Vibar is to allow waxes to hold more fragrance, not necessarily throw it better. A lot of waxes on the market really can't hold more than three to five percent normally. And adding some Vibar can increase the fragrance retention up to, say, seven or eight percent or whatever. Um, that is the main reason for Vibar. It is a bonding agent, almost like a glue for your wax and allows it to hold more fragrance oil. It also has some benefits of dispersing liquid dye and other additives more evenly throughout the candle. So it, it just makes things a little bit more consistent. However, I have been an advocate of occasionally being able to use Vibar to help with little minor things. Because Vibar does distribute things evenly, my thought was, is there a chance that it could actually maybe make 464 throw the wax, throw fragrance oil a little bit better as opposed to how it normally does. There are people that say Vibar has made a difference for them in hot throw. I've never really noticed a difference in hot throw, one that I, at least enough of one that I would ever claim was due specifically to Vibar. So my answer with 464 is, did the Vibar help the hot throw? I would say no. I did not notice any difference whatsoever using Vibar or not using Vibar, and I would not want to recommend that as some kind of solution to improving your hot throw. The next thing was whether Vibar would help with surface defects, surface problems, uh, frosting, rough tops, cottage cheese, looking tops, stuff like that. And here I would say uh, moderate, uh, maybe a little bit of success, but again, I don't think it's enough to justify using it because the results were a little inconsistent. I did notice some fairly significant improvements on a few of the candles, if you remember from part one. But in further testing, I didn't get the exact same results across the board consistently. So I, I would feel, I, I wouldn't feel very confident telling you that 464 is going to be a magic fix to surface problems when it comes to using 464. My advice there would be to test it for yourself and see what kind of results you get from using it. I did, however, find that the pour temperature and the temperature in the area, the room that you're pouring your candles in, has a better effect on the surface and the overall appearance of your candle, more so than using Vibar alone did. And then the last thing we asked about with Vibar was whether or not it would help with sinkholes and air pockets and drowning wicks. Again, I would say moderately, maybe occasionally, but nothing substantial and uh, nothing that I would consider reliable proof or evidence. Um, for example, as you'll see in this video here, in these pictures that the lavender driftwood, which did have the Vibar in it, it drowned out minutes into being lit because of a hidden sinkhole underneath that I thought the Vibar had probably had, had actually fixed or prevented because the surface looked great. And I didn't, I didn't want to go doing anything checking at the time, like with uh, poking holes or anything like that, because I wanted to, I wanted to test as if we hadn't done that, right? Because if I would have had to poke holes, I would have had to fill them in and then I would have had no proof of whether or not Vibar actually worked, if that made, made any sense. But long story short, even though the ones that I used Vibar, once I lit them, uh, it eventually found some sinkholes in the wax and uh, of course it caused some drowning out and the wicks never burned right. I had to fix the candles. So I would not say whatsoever that the Vibar actually helped with sinkholes. On occasion, it seemed like there might have been a correlation, but it doesn't appear that it is a, a, a magic fix for sinkholes, unfortunately. Now, before we move to the next section, uh, talking about my overall thoughts and tips and tricks for using 464, I did want to mention, and I did this in the last video too, and I got some pretty good feedback for it, so I'm going to continue to mention this anytime I think it makes sense. Anytime you're wanting to track some of your testing and your results and your documentation, your notes, anything like that about testing that you're doing, or product development or whatever, I would do that in some kind of system. It can be a notebook, it can be a Google Keep Notes, it can be a uh, Excel spreadsheet, journal, whatever. But I personally use them in testing records that I create inside of CraftyBase. I'm not gonna go into detail in this video. I have a whole video series talking about CraftyBase um, that I use for you know, recipes and inventory and 
pricing and all of that, but I also track all my testing in those in that too. People have been asking me how I track my testing. I do it in Crafty Base, um, and I will do a video on how I track that when I get a chance. I'm getting kind of backlogged on video requests at the moment, but I will definitely be putting a video together how I track my testing. But instead of making you wait forever, just know that I use Crafty Base to do it um, by creating test projects or test products. And then I, uh, I keep all my notes in that. And then I've got this historical reference of how I tested everything and I can always look back to uh, whenever I need to. It might be a, a year or two or five years from now when I was like, okay, I wanna do 464 again. And I don't wanna have to try to remember everything I did. So that allows me to go back into my records and see exactly what I did, what the results were, uh, my whole process, everything. I'll, I'll link some of that information for, below if you wanna check it out for yourself. Okay, so let's move on to this last section, which is my overall thoughts and tips for using 464, um, at least at least in these two specific jars. <laughs> Take this information and advice as kind of a guideline, like a baseline, and then you'll need to adjust and of course test for yourself in, uh, in other jars. But for these two jars, I'm gonna talk about the things that I found helpful, and hopefully you find this helpful as well. For me, the best pour temp was about 150 degrees. Now, I have had success pouring at lower temperatures, and you will see lots of varying opinions on the best pour temperature range. Some people swear pouring at like really low temps, like 115 to 125, somewhere there. Other people pour hot. Um, I found 150 to work the best for me. When I poured lower, I ended up with some crazy uh, cosmetic effects and some sinkhole problems. Pouring hotter, I had just as many, if not more sinkhole problems. So for me, 150 was kind of that ideal mark, but, and this is very, very important, 150 degrees is what worked best for me in my testing environment with my ambient room temperature, which is really the second tip uh, and, and more important than the first one. I would keep your room temperature somewhere between 72 and 74 degrees which is kind of warm, right? So you're not gonna wanna make your candles in your bedroom or uh, in your living room where you're wanting to be more comfortable at a 70 to 72 range. Um, but if you're gonna do it in your kitchen, try to control the airflow. You want consistent temperature and consistent airflow. For example, when I make my candles in my temporary kind of makeshift workshop area right now, which is down in the basement, and it's a finished basement and everything, but it's drafty down there. But you know, basements get kind of drafty and cold. When I make candles down there, they don't turn out near as good as the candles that I will make upstairs on the main level. And that is because of airflow. I need consistent airflow and consistent temperatures. If you're making your candles in an area that's either cold all the time or, or fluctuating in temperature, um, it's difficult to get great consistent results all the time. So I would find a temperature controlled area, the best that you can, an area where you can keep things consistent, airflow and temperature. I would try to keep that at around 72 or 73 or so. Um, and then again, for me, pour temp at 150, but once you figure out your room temperature, test a few different pour temperatures and just see which one works best for you. It could be wildly different than mine. And that's why it's important to document your specific notes and details because we are all going to have things that work better for us and they will vary from person to person. So many times you see people recommending specific pour temperatures and specific processes to other candle makers that just don't work out well and then they think it's bad advice. Well, the truth was is it worked perfectly for them but you might need to alter it for your environment, your, your situation. The next thing I would say is that there's probably just no need to add Vibar. Uh, it was fun testing it out and I did see some promising early results, but I don't think I saw anything definitive enough that would make me feel confident in recommending a Vibar for using in 464. There is a side benefit of using Vibar that increases the wax uh, melt point by a couple degrees, which could or could not help in shipping in hot weather, but I don't know that it's gonna raise it enough to really solve that problem either. So if it was me, I would just probably leave Vibar out of 464, at least for now. Next would be fragrance oil selection. So as I talked about a few times, the hot throw uh, was good at times and not good at others, and it really is dependent on the fragrance oil itself. 464, like most soy waxes, it can be very, very picky on which oils work well. So make sure you're using high quality oils, which most of the oils you're getting are probably considered high quality oils, but you really, really wanna sample and test your oils with 464 before you go spend a lot of money on several bottles or several pounds because this wax is picky on its fragrance oils. When you find ones that work well, they work great. When you find ones that don't work very well, the hot throw is very faint. Don't try to force fragrance oils that don't wanna throw very well to try to be better than they are. 
trying to manipulate your process and force things to happen by trying things isn't going to solve the problem. It just complicates your workflow. It complicates your processes. Trust me, for years, I tried to manipulate things with my candles and with my waxes to do things that they just didn't want to do. It created headache and anxiety and a waste of time and a waste of money. I found oils that I absolutely loved and I just couldn't get them to throw very well. And it was, I did everything in my power to try to force them to, and it, it was just stressful. Don't change your entire process around to fit one oil. If an oil doesn't work, doesn't perform very well, just move on and try another one. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of fragrance oils out there from thousands of companies. You will find ones that you like and work. There is no shortage of opportunity and possibilities out there for fragrance oils. So be picky and choose the right ones for your wax. Next, let's talk about wicks. Um, I didn't talk a lot about wick testing in the video, mostly because none of the changes and variables we were making were going to affect wicking. The poor temp wasn't gonna affect wicking, the vibar didn't affect wicking. All these little things we were doing didn't really have an impact on wicking. But with that being said, what wicks did I found worked the best with 464? Uh, I would say it's a CD Wix. Now, anyone that has watched my All About Wix video, uh, it's a pretty long detailed Wix video, it was actually one of my first ever videos, I do mention in there that I'm not a big fan of CD Wix. That's still true. In 95% of waxes, I don't like CD Wix for a few reasons, but I think they are the best in 464. Uh, great hot throw, great burn profile. Uh, they don't lean over near as bad in this wax as they do other waxes. They just seem to be a great combination together, the, these two, uh, CD Wix and 464. Some people do use other ones. In my experience, these were the ones that worked best, at least for these two jars. So um, speaking of which, in the nine ounce straight sided jar uh, and the seven ounce mason or the eight ounce mason jar, they're pretty identical jars. Like they're pretty much the same size, but I would start with a CD eight in, in the nine ounce straight sided jar. And I would use the CD 10 um, potentially either the eight or the 10 in the mason jar. Even though they're the same size for the most part, the mason jar does have these more of a squared look. So these corners uh, might need just a little bit extra heat, a little bit extra wick to reach them. So I would probably start with an eight in both, um, but you might wanna go up a little bit on the mason. And again, like I talk about in every video where I mention wicks, definitely test for yourself and your wicks can and usually will change based on some different fragrance oils. So just because I'd say CD8 and a CD10 is a good starting point, be ready to test that out with every fragrance oil you use and you might need to adjust it a size or two depending on the fragrance oil. The last overall thought and tip for 464, and this is a huge one. I, I feel like this is a must or a requirement for using 464, at least in some jars. And that is poking relief holes to fix those sinkholes. Now, you can fix your sinkholes in another way if you have another method you prefer, but poking relief holes is a very simple one. I have a video on this topic that's actually a pretty fun video. It's my last video I just posted, so it's very recent. I will post it uh, in the description below and link it several places. Check out that video. It is very important for this wax because they're often underneath the wax and you have no idea they are there until it is too late. And to further prove this point, I showed you a few candles in the videos uh, and pictures going on during this video while I was talking uh, of the wicks drowning out because of sinkholes. Every single one of those candles I was able to fix by just, I had to empty out a little of the wax to get back down to the wick, of course. So I took a skewer and opened up some of those cavities by poking some holes. Um, and then I filled them back in with a heat gun, let them reharden, and then I lit them again to see what would happen. And they were all burned perfectly after that point. They all were fixed, so to speak. So it's best to do this from the beginning uh, so that your customer doesn't run into a, a busted candle or a candle doesn't want to burn right. So do what you can to prevent and mitigate those sinkholes from the very beginning by poking relief holes or some other method. Again, check out that video if you are interested. Well, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed this video. I, I would be interested in your thoughts about this video series um, and future video series about other waxes. Uh, please put in the comment section what waxes you would be interested in me testing and reviewing on the channel as well. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next time.